All right, green chemistry. So first of all, with green chemistry, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over a little bit of unit one, two revision. There's just going to be two slides on it, and maybe the third slide is a little bit of revision, but nonetheless. First one is the continuous cycle. I, pardon me, have pulled that exact quote from the study design. That is literally what is in the study design. That diagram is in the study design. That is what you need to remember for this year. That is what you will have covered last year. You will have covered this whole idea of linear versus circular economy. The whole idea that, let's use copper wiring as an example. Copper wiring is pretty expensive to make these days because copper is becoming less common, harder to sort of work with. What you find is that you have mined some copper, you make some copper wiring, um, you have distrib distributed it out, you've used it, but then you don't need the product anymore, so you go throw the product out, but what if you remove that copper wiring? You remove that copper wiring, you send it to a recycling company, which will then take that copper wiring, it'll either melt it down and remake copper wiring, or if it's in good enough condition, it'll just continue to, it'll just sort of straighten it back out, you know, give it a little bit of a polish up, do whatever it needs to just to make it back to brand new or close to brand new as it can, and then it remakes another product and it utilizes that copper wiring. And the whole idea is that copper wiring stays in the system or that copper stays in the system. Now, if you just throw it out, well then that's a waste of copper. And that's a linear economy, throwing that stuff out. Now, greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases are gases in the Earth's atmosphere that absorb and trap heat um, assisting, to the reg assisting to regulate and ensure that the planet has sufficient temperature. Now, what's really important about greenhouse gases is you need to understand the process by how they work. So, during the day, the sun's UV rays heat up the Earth. So, the sun, it's out like right now. It wasn't out this morning, which is why I have a jumper on and now I'm getting a bit warm. The sun's out, sends its UVs down and the UVs sort of enter, this, enter the atmosphere um, and they actually heat up the ground. They don't heat up the air, they heat up the ground. As they heat up the ground, um, the heat is released, and especially at night. At night, so during the day there is heat release, but it's sort of like proportionate to what's going on around it. At night, there's nothing sort of going on around it, so it's releasing lots of heat. And that's why the ground becomes really cold, and then obviously the, the outside starts to become colder and colder as that heat is lost. Um, this is released back in the atmospheres, and back into the atmosphere and without greenhouse gases or GHGs the heat would essentially just rise and be released from our atmosphere and essentially every night we'd freeze we would freeze and we would probably freeze to death that's how cold it would get greenhouse gases ensure that this does not happen um, and they do allow some out that's the idea if we have greenhouse gases in their correct proportions we will trap the correct amount of heat and we work perfectly well. However, obviously that doesn't always happen and our greenhouse gases are not in perfect balance. Now, also what's really important is you need to know what the five main greenhouse gases are from year 11. Um, and I'm hoping you remember it. If you don't remember it or you wanna have a go at it, just pause the video now and just have a quick, have a quick think, write them down the page. There are five main ones. And then I want you to highlight which of those five do, does not occur naturally. Which of those five have we added to the atmosphere now and they've become a greenhouse gas since we started creating them? So take a minute, when you pause, three, two, one. All right, hopefully you are back and you had a go at this question. So there are five main greenhouse gases and these are carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, nitrous oxide. Those are the four natural ones. They're the ones that naturally occur and are just there. Then we have fluorinated gases. So fluorinated gases are gases that have a fluorine molecule on them. They are very harmful to the environment and they have contributed to this rise in greenhouse gases and this temperature rise of our planet because we've synthetically produced them and they were never a greenhouse gas and now they are. So then we sort of discuss from here the enhanced greenhouse effect. You will have covered this last year, but you cover it in a lot more detail this year, more on the basis of that you start to do some gas calculations and determine, you know, how much of this has been produced, how much of that has been produced. Sort of that's that aspect of things. 
The enhanced greenhouse effect is what we currently refer to as the major cause of climate change. It's due to an increased proportion of greenhouse gases, particularly fluorinated gases from fuel and infrastructure production. Very simple and basic definition of it. Uh, the increased ability for the planet to absorb and retain infrared radiation has subsequently began to slowly warm the planet. This has shifted climate norms and increased sea levels, which is due to sort of the glacier melting from the increased pole temperatures. So the poles of the planet are getting warmer quicker than the middle of the planet is getting warmer. It's just, that's a little bit of physics. You don't need to worry about that side of things, but it's something that you need to know for chemistry and then you need to explain it in a chemical point of view. You need to talk about what are the greenhouse gases. And then this is where that green chemistry comes into it. What if we can minimize greenhouse gases in our production? Will we do it? Should we do it? Etc. Something like that. Now what's really new for our three, four is that the, the VCAR study design has placed this significance on these green chemistry principles. Now, you may have talked about these last year. They're, they're not significantly, they're not sort of put in an area of study. They're put at the start of the Unit 3 4 study design, and it's sort of just said you need to know these. So, a lot of students that I've already talked with have already done this in Unit 1 2. They covered this in Unit 1 2 because that's what their school wanted them to get, in, get their sort of head around. If you haven't, that is okay. It is essentially aimed for you to start this in 3-4. So you're just doing what VC wants. Now there are, I believe it's seven, seven concepts you need to know. <clears throat> seven concepts are atom economy, catalysts or catalyzing, design for degradation, uh, design for energy efficiency, design for saving chemicals, prevention, use of renewable feedstock. So these are seven essentially definitions and concepts that you need to know to answer green chemistry based questions. So you will get a question and it will be, you know, uh, you know, something about using a fuel cell instead of using, instead of using, you know, standard combustion. You may have no idea what I'm talking about there. Do not stress, um, but it is something you will learn. Um, and you might sit there and go, what, what is that all about? What's really important is that that is one of these, that is using some of these topics here. So when we use a fuel cell, we're using things like designing safe, safer chemicals and design for energy efficiency. Um, and you'll understand why, you know, as you learn this stuff, but it's what I would refer to. If I was asked why I was making that decision in terms of green chemistry principles, I would say I'm making that decision because of this principle and this principle, which state that da 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 and then sort of refer it back to the example I was discussing. So then we have each of their definitions. Now, what I've done is I'm going to mix them up. So I think this is a really good activity. Um, it's something that I run with my chemistry classes and I thought, you know what, I'll give you a little, you know, taste of what we sort of run in our, in our sessions um, at ShootSmart. So getting a little, you know, little sprinkling of what we do before we even do it. Um, but nonetheless, I want you all to have a go at this. I want you to match up each of these, these concepts. So what you'll find is that there are seven concepts, there are seven definitions. I want you to match them up. So, you know, you go 1A, 2B, et cetera. It's obviously not gonna be in that order, but don't worry. Um, I want you to have a go at that. This shouldn't take you more than a couple of minutes. Um, and you may not know, you may read through and go, I have no idea what some of these mean. I have no idea what some of these definitions are talking about. That's okay. This, is the, this may be the first time you're doing it, and that's fine. But I want you to have a go at it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you all to pause, and then I'd say take you know five minutes at least. Um, if you finish it earlier, that's okay. And then unpause, and we'll go through it. So three, two, one, pause. All right, hopefully you are back. By the way, I do love my coffee. That's why I've got a coffee here. Let's go through each of these. So we'll start off at the top of the concepts, and then we'll will um, we'll, uh, give it its definition now. That's meant to say definition up there. I do apologize. Concept, it's meant to say definition. Um, I do apologize for that. Uh, nonetheless, let's have a look. So we've got atom economy. You should remember atom economy from last year. Atom economy was where the atoms that we used at the start of the uh, chemical equation when as close to 100% used in the desired product. So if only one of the two things that were produced was the desired product, we want to maximize that percentage. So which of these talks about that? 
So we need to look at things like reactants um, or the start of a chemical equation. No, 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 also no. Look, that one sort of gives it away for which one that one is, but it's not. Uh, it's better to prevent waste. No, well, it kind of has to be G, but process should be designed to maximize the incorporation of all reactor materials used in the process into the final product. So that is exactly what atom economy is. So therefore I'm going to say that it is G. Apologies, I'm using my old Mac mouse pad and it's not very good for doing things like that. All right, atom economy is G. Two, catalysts. So remember that catalysts, what they do is they provide an alternative reaction pathway um, and they use essentially less energy to get what they want. Um, so essentially what you do is you're adding in a catalyst and they get what you want utilizing less energy because they provide an alternative reaction pathway. So once again, reading through, um, I remember there was one that talked about less energy. Uh, it was B. These should be selected to generate the same desired product with less waste and less, en less energy and reagents in the reaction process. That is a catalyst. That is a perfect definition of a catalyst. Answer here for two is B. All right, three. Three, design for degradation. Um, so we'll read from the top. We're not going to do B or G. A, chemical products should be designed so that at the end of their use, they break down to harmless degrada uh, degradation products um, and do not persist in the environment. Well, that sounds pretty good. I'm just going to check the others. Chemicals should be designed to their intent of minimizing toxicity. That's how it's safe for chemicals. The raw materials feedstock. That's in the feedstock one. So I have maximum energy. No. Yeah. So A, three is A. All right. Four, design for energy efficiency. Well, we just read that one. Um, and that one was down here. So process should be designed for maximum energy efficiency with the minimal in a negative environment and economical impacts. I'm pretty happy with that. I think four is E. And then we go to five. Five was safer chemicals. Again, we read this one just before. That one was here at C, which is designed to achieve their intended function with minimizing toxicity. Makes sense. All right. And then we have prevention and we have use of renewable feedstock. We have D and we have F. So we've got raw materials feedstock should be made from renewable materials rather than from fossil fuels. It is better to prevent waste than to treat or clean up waste after it's been produced. Well, it's pretty obvious which is which. Prevention is going to be the prevent waste one. They use the word in the definition. Not really a great way to do it, but that's what they did. And then the raw material feedstock um, is mainly, you know, plant-based. That is going to be use of renewable feedstock. So that is our aspect here. So we go 1G, 2B, 3A, 4E, 5C, 6F, 7D. That is how we go about it. They are our definitions. These have been pulled straight out of the chemistry study design. These are the definitions they provide you. So you should know these as much as I don't, when you know word for word, I want you to know them pretty reasonably. I want you to be able to explain each of these seven concepts. And this is something you should practice throughout, particularly throughout term one, so that you can apply these in your chemistry-based or your green chemistry-based questions as they come up. So then just our last point in green chemistry, and we're actually not gonna cover any of these green chemistry points today. There are three explicit examples of green chemistry that they want you to know in this year no for the end of year exam. So there will be more that they'll apply green chemistry to, but these are three that they have explicitly said you need to know. Now, the only one that's part of area study one, unit three is fuel cell sustainability as per this green circle. However, we're not even gonna cover it today because we're not gonna get up to redox. So it will be covered in the next lecture, um, but it's really important that you understand that there are some examples VCAR has made distinctly what like they've distinctly said that you need to know this. Like we're gonna ask about it. I'm telling you now, we're gonna ask about it. That's what they've said. So fuel cell sustainability, what does that use? So these are the concepts that you should refer to when discussing these. 
Same with equilibria and industry and green hydrogen. Now, each of these points will come up at another point in time. Do not stress. But just wanted to point out these are the ones that I've already gone through these um, in going through the new study design and producing content for them. I've already gone through each of these concepts. I've you know gone and done the research uh, and discussed what's sort of going on. I've also gone through and picked out the ones that I feel are most relevant. Um, and I've found that in some of the newer content being produced, um, especially throughout ATAR notes and by other tutors, we've sort of agreed that these are the ones that are the most relevant for each of these concepts um, and what you should probably discuss in discussing these concepts. Um, you can find these dot points in the, um, in the study design, which obviously I've got my data booklet here, but I've got my study design here. So you can find, if you scroll through this here, you will find the dot points. Um, my word is struggling. I think my computer is doing a bit too much at the moment. Um, but as you can see here, I just want to find that dot point. Here is that question in green chemistry. Contemporary responses to challenges in the role of innovation in the design of fuel cells to meet society's energy needs with reference to green chemistries. They've given these two. So they've said design of energy efficiency and use of renewable feedstock. We've added catalysts to that because we feel like catalysts are something that are utilized in fuel cells. You'll find them in the electrolyte. They're really important to it to make fuel cells work. And thus it's a concept that should be added onto that. So as you can see there, the dot points have explicitly asked you to know this, something you do need to learn throughout the year. So 